Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. This is Marta's Sci-Fi Seminar, and this is our fifth video having to do with drafting. If you've made it this far, then you may be 20,000 words into your first novel. All the videos on this channel and its companion channel, uh, Marta's Magical Mystery Class, are all about helping you figure out how to write, edit, and prepare a first novel for publication in about a year and a half over the, if you watch all the videos every, if you watch each video every two weeks. Um, and, or if you're one of my subscribers, and I love that the subscriber base is growing. And so you're seeing these videos as they come out every two weeks. So 20,000 words is fantastic, folks. If you are starting to get a little internal resistance, if you're starting to feel like, ooh, I wish I'd done that differently. Ooh, I really need to recast this. Ooh, I really need to change that around. That's really normal at this part of the process. You're about a third of the way. And some part of your brain knows you've already come a long way, but that part of your brain also knows there's still a really long way to go. And that can cause some kind of clutch reactions. So hang in there. Um, I got about halfway through my first novel when I decided that, oh yeah, I wasn't writing this in first person. I needed to write it in third person. And at that point, I wanted to go and rip out everything from the first half of the novel so that I could change the point of view. And I made the decision to stay the course and keep drafting. I did start drafting in third person from that point forward. So we're going to, if those terms are confusing to you, we will get to talking about point of view in a future video. Um, but just know that you may be feeling an impulse to make big changes at this point. Please just make note of those changes or as I said, feel free to make those changes going forward, but don't stop what you're doing and go back and edit yet. However strong that temptation is, just keep moving forward. All right, so we've been talking about elements of fiction, and today I'm only going to talk to you about one element of fiction because I think it's a, I think character and plot are big, um, but setting might be my favorite because especially in science fiction, when you're talking about the setting of the story, you know, setting is one of the th things that it sounds like it should be no big deal. You know, it's just like the theatrical backdrop against which all of your action is happening. But actually, especially in science fiction, your setting can have a huge impact on your plot, on your characters, on the point of view from which the story is being told, on the themes that you might want to include in your story. So. Um, setting is not sort of as prim and tidy as the word might imply, like you're putting a china setting on a table. No. Um, the term that often gets used in science fiction instead of setting, and that I like a whole lot better for any fiction, is world building, because that sounds as powerful as it really is. You are creating the world your readers will inhabit, and even if that world happens to resemble uh, the one that most of us occupy, um, it's still a big task. You decide what details you include, you decide what details you leave out, you decide what you emphasize, you decide what you ignore, and of course if you're creating a setting that will be less familiar, as many fantasy and science fiction works do, then you have all kinds of things to figure out. Uh, what are the rules of your universe? How does the science work? How does the magic work? Um, there are a number of ways that various science fiction fantasy writers have approached that. Some of them uh, make lots and lots of um, side documents outlining all those things, um, setting up all those things. Um, that, again, when we talk about the plotter versus pantser approach, uh, the um, more 
organized uh, versus the more intuitive writer, um, then there's a kind of similar thing, I think, happening when we're talking about world building. There are going to be people who like to have it all figured out before they get started. Um, then there are going to be the rest of us uh, who are either figuring it out at the moment, um, inventing it as we go along. That would be the pantser approach or the entirely intuitive approach. A lot of us do some of each. Um, there are certain things that we're going to sketch out beforehand, but there are certain things that we stay open to. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Ooh, that's kind of fun. Um, and I'll get into a special case of that when I um, uh, come to the end of our little conversation here about setting. Um, but suffice it to say, in my case, the exercise I find most useful is what I call walking around in the world of the book. Um, and for that, I try to imagine the setting of the novel. I try to imagine my characters in that setting. And whereas in the actual novel, lots of things have to happen. Scenes have to have, each individual scene has to carry its weight in the rest of the book. It has to help move the plot forward. Um, but when I'm doing this walking around in the novel exercise, I slow all that way down. And I like to just create scenarios where my characters are doing really boring daily stuff in the world of the novel. And it gives me a really good feel for how I want things to fit together. Now, sometimes bits of that writing end up in the novel, but a whole scene where somebody does nothing but come in by herself uh, and get a cup of coffee in a cafe and then walk out with her coffee and start going over her work notes for the day. That's less compelling as a scene um, than if she's interacting with other characters, uh, than if um, various other events are occurring. But those kind, writing out those kinds of scenes, doing that act of walking around in the novel helps me as a writer really foreground the world building. I get to think about um, everything that I expect. Usually I walk around with Demeter, who's the central character in my books. Um, I get to think about everything that Demeter can see in a given location, because we're very visually oriented, most of us. Um, I get to think about everything Demeter can hear in a given location in the book. But I also try to focus on the other senses. Um, what can Demeter smell in that location? Like fresh coffees, great smell. Um, but maybe she can also smell some things that aren't so great, like has it grain washed the dogs recently? If the dogs are down in the cafe, does the cafe smell like unwashed dog? Okay. Um, so sights, sounds, smells, what does Demeter taste? Again, in a cafe, there are going to be all kinds of food options for taste. Um, but if you are really incorporating um, uh, a unique setting, especially, uh, or what may feel like a more unique setting, especially, even conveying the taste of the air can be useful. Is the air, does the air kind of seem a little stale? Is the air salty? Are we in a sea area? Uh, are we in a bakery where the, the very air tastes like powdered sugar? Um, so taste isn't just food. Taste can be just literally the taste of the place your character is in. Um, the last sense to be thinking about is touch. What are the tactile or, you know, in the case of Casper, which is the uh, cosmic crossroads I write about, um, the friendly ghost manifestations can't be touched, and yet they move in and out of one another, they move in and out of 
the residents of Casper and the um, other more fixed furnishings, shall we say, um, of Casper. So what is tangible and what is not tangible is an important part of the world I evoke when I'm writing. So world building is includes whatever you can imagine, whatever you need to imagine um, for the place your characters are going to inhabit or the places your characters are going to inhabit over the course of the novel. Um, and world building isn't just about how that place looks, but it's about how all of your characters' senses and how all your readers' senses will engage with that place. So um, whatever more formal kind of cataloging um, you want to do ahead of time to set up the rules of your world um, and whatever intuitive sorts of things you want to welcome in in the moment, I do strongly recommend doing some walking around in the world of your book with a focus on all of those sensory details that your character can perceive. And I, I have a character who is visually not my main character, Demeter, but Igraine, who is a strong secondary character, Igraine is visually impaired. So the way Igraine perceives the world, um, and particularly the way Igraine can perceive these friendly, ghostly manifestations, is different um, than the way other characters perceive that world. So it's worth being sensitive to how you are incorporating those kinds of things as well. Um, moving on into, I promised at the end of our setting discussion, I had something very special to share with you. Um, in a very unique case of getting to walk around in the world of the story, um, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit in the novella that I'm working on that will be a prequel to the two novels, Demeter West and the Ghost Town Glitch, Demeter West and the Absent Presence. Um, and I'm struggling in the prequel because I actually, rather than picturing things happen in happening in the Casper of our world, which is actually the Casper of Demeter's world, um, I need to be able to set some scenes for the first time in some of these other parallel worlds, in some of these intersecting realities. And I find myself really kind of struggling and feeling at sea in a world, uh, in worlds that are so different. And one of the ways I've been able to dip my toes in the water was presented to me by uh, my friend Hope Martin, who is an artist. Her YouTube channel is Hope Martin Artist. Uh, you may notice on this channel, there's, in addition to all of the very well-labeled videos that are all about uh, the drafting process and the things that we're doing, there's this video that's just called Tech Rehearsal. And it has Hope and I just the thumbnails of us uh, looking like we're about to tear our hair out. Um, that tech rehearsal video, we did that on my channel where we actually hosted our broadcast on Hope's channel, but it was our first uh, co uh, coordinated uh, collaborative live stream. And what Hope and I did was uh, she gave me a piece of art to write something about Casper based on this piece of art. I gave her a piece of writing about Casper so she could create an artwork um, based on the writing I had done about Casper. And it has, for me, it has had this lovely effect of evolving into a little side project um, that won't be part of the, uh, some of the things I'm writing about may end up in some of the main narratives about Casper, uh, but it has ended up being the, uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau, Casper Convention and Visitors Bureau Wildlife Guide and the Casper Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, Ghostly Wildlife Guide and the Ghostly Plant Guide, which has been a huge amount of fun to play with. Um, I do need to, Hope and I do need to do a little more technical coordination um, so that I can get copies of her art files and then I'll be putting all that up uh, on the blog at DemeterWest.com. So you'll be able to see both my writing for this uh, 
ghostly wildlife guide and Hope's artwork for the ghostly wildlife guide and then my writing for the ghostly plant guide and Hope's uh, artwork that goes with the ghostly plant guide. We've only just got initial entries for these so far. We do want to do another collaboration and another live stream, um, but it has been a wonderful and unique way to do some walking around in the world of the book. Um, so I highly recommend going to Hope Martin Artist, looking up Hope Martin Artist here on YouTube and checking out Hope's channel. You can watch the recorded uh, version of our live stream, which was from one week ago on Sunday night. Um, my recommendation uh, is, I'm going to recommend a lot of things, but I'm going to do so very simply. Read Gail Carriger. That's, that's the essence of my recommendation. We're talking about setting. One of my very favorite settings is Gail, Carriger, Gail Carriger's uh, Victorian London um, because it is Victorian London with steampunk technology, with vampires, with werewolves, uh, with racial, gender, uh, with diversity along the lines of race, gender, sexual orientation, um, with a lot of really wonderful contemporary sensibilities that are still consistent with the Victorian worldview. Um, they're, they're so smart and they're so funny and the world building is so thoughtful. The, the science will just blow your mind. Um, Gail has put a lot of thought into how uh, etheromagnetics works. She has extrapolated from um, one of the original Victorian theories for uh, what air was made up of and how all of these things worked. It was a theory that obviously did not pan out, but in Carragher's world it did and it enables a whole lot of other things to happen. Um, so um, her books, The Parasol Protectorate is my favorite. It's a five book series, soulless, changeless, blameless, heartless, and timeless. Um, but she also has uh, The Custard Protocol that works as a kind of sequel uh, series to the Parasol Protectorate series. She's also got the Finishing School series that works almost like a, a prequel uh, to the uh, Parasol Protectorate series. Um, she's also written some one-off titles. She's also written some shorter novellas uh, that are in this world that she's created. Um, it's so much fun. She is so much fun. Um, she's Gail is amazing, and um, everything I've said about world building, she's just a fantastic example of how you can bring together so many different things and make it all look easy, which it won't in your first draft, and that's okay. Um, it's a draft. It can be as messy as you need it to be. Just keep going, keep writing, keep reading. Um, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.